I have a hard time telling. I also, by the way, lost my voice like two days ago. So I'm glad we have a mic because I can't project all that loud. So if my voice goes in and out, that's why. Please bear with me. Um, by the way, I really wish I didn't say I'll go second after Andrew because now I'm going to seem like, I don't know, like, like, like I just barely got into this, which I kind of did relative. By the way, just show of hands, how many people, who's, who, who considers themselves to be a newbie to all this stuff, who, who's experienced, who's, who's a newbie, who's with me? Oh, thank God. Okay, good. That makes me feel a lot better. Um, tell you a little bit about myself. Um, along those same lines, maybe for about 18 months, I'll say. It was, I don't know, uh, Ryan actually kind of introduced me to everything, I don't know, 18 months, two years ago, somewhere along that line. We were talking and he mentioned the word Bitcoin and I kind of sat, <laughs> right? So um, in the role of an advisor and an investor, I've, I, I've kind of been, you know, new to the whole blockchain cryptocurrency world. Um, for 12 years, I worked at a public accounting firm. I did a lot of strategy, um, a lot of focus on tax strategy. Uh, I put up here, I'm a recovering or former consultant because I actually just left that firm after 12 years about a month ago. Started my new job as a controller four days ago. Um, so kind of whirlwind of, uh, of time going on for me, but um, it's kind of where I come from. I come from the public world. I come from a lot of, lot of involvement with tax. When I heard about this, as somebody who's, I just try to keep my ear to the ground, it was really interesting to me. Uh, my first thought was also, man, how does, what's the IRS gonna do with this? Um, what's the state, the cities, what are they all gonna do? Because we all know one thing about them is they are generally pretty antiquated and this is extremely cutting edge. And by the time I finish saying the word cutting edge, it's probably even more cutting edge. So we're dealing with government agencies that probably don't have the ability to comprehend a lot of this stuff. Um, as Andrew said, you got regulators who we hear them talk. It's pretty obvious they're not entirely educated on what they're talking about. And I was really kind of interested in it. Um, just a disclosure, I'm currently holding Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Ripple tokens. Um, married with two kids. Uh, one of my kids, market was up when she was born, didn't know what to do with her money. I went, hey, crypto sound like a good idea. Let's see how that works for her. <laughs> um, so I kind of believe in this stuff. I'm a little, little passionate about it. I'm glad to see that a lot of you guys raised your hands and said you feel like you're newbies because I'm passionate about something that I kind of like understand about this much about from a technological standpoint. Um, that being said, I've done a decent amount of research on kind of the tax aspects. And from talking to different people about it, um, reading you know, all, all kinds of articles, I realized there's kind of a need to just go like, hey, let's think about some things. And so um, the purpose of today is um, really to discuss not necessarily strategies and what you should or shouldn't do. I think Ryan said it, and I, and I think Andrew said it, and I'm not sure if you guys are, sh are sure, but nothing we are saying today is to be taken as legal or, or official tax advice. Uh, we cannot stress that enough. Um, the purpose of um, you know, what we're going to be talking about is, 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 again, not formal advice. It's really stuff to think about. Um, I advise everybody, if, you are, if you're thinking about getting involved in cryptos, talk to a tax advisor. If you have already been involved buying, if you've sold anything, talk to a tax advisor. When I say a tax advisor, I'm going to really kind of clarify that and say a tax professional. Um, I'm not talking about H&R Block, I'm not talking about Jackson Hewitt, I'm certainly not talking about TurboTax. Um, I'll tell you, if, if your tax person bills you by the form or something like that, that's a tax preparer. I try to make a kind of a distinction between tax preparers and tax professionals. There's people who put the stuff on the form, and then there's the people who really strategize and think it through and go, hey, what's best for you? What should we do now? Anything we should wait till later? People who are ca having conversations with you about next year's tax return in October and in November as they're strategizing and planning. So when I say tax professional, find yourself one of those. They're going to be pretty expensive, depending on who you may have used in the past. I generally would knock people off their socks when I said I charge $200 an hour. At minimum, for a simple return, might be six, eight, six to $800. And go, Jackson Hewitt, HR Block, it's like 200 bucks. Yeah, well, again, prepare professional. We're going to think some things through. Very important. I stress this a lot because there is a lot of um, risk that may be involved as far as taxation goes with this kind of stuff. So find somebody who can help you, who is educated, um, and who's gonna be able to really strategize for you. Keep in mind, your individual situation is unique from everybody else's. 
Um, so the guidance I'm giving you here is to be a kind of an overall review of things to think about. Most importantly, it is food for thought. Okay? Again, don't go, hey, that guy said I should probably save this, or I need to do that, or hey, I'm going to be subject to this. This is food for thought. The stuff I want to give you here is things to take back to your tax professional and go, I heard about this. I wanted to tell you I've been involved. I sold some cryptos. I bought them. Don't know if I sold them. Is there any impact? Things to think about. Don't be like this guy. Article I found on Yahoo, this was literally the headline, Bitcoin trader after discussion with his accountant, taxes. Right? There's the link. Um, he went by the name Latex Man, I guess. Didn't want any, anybody to be known. By the way, not that guy. I think everybody's seen him around. Um, <laughs> You can kind of read up there, but the general gist of it was guys buying and selling in cryptos. He's doing a great, having a great year, as a lot of people did, who might, may have sold anything in 17. Sits down with his tax accountant and goes, wait a minute, what? How much? I thought maybe I was, I thought I, thought I didn't need to even disclose it because, and, and, and I won't point anybody out, but some, I, at least one person in this room has, all, has already talked to me and said, How do, do I have to report it? Does he, it's not like cash, right? It's not like a stock that's on the SEC. People don't know about it, right? So I don't have to report it, right? And the general rule is, well, yeah, you do. And any tax accountant who, who's worth their weight in anything, it's going to tell you, yeah, you absolutely have to report it. So this guy obviously was pretty upset about um, after having that conversation. So I just kind of don't want you guys to be in that position. Think about it. Um, Andrew talked a little bit about, um, you know, again, getting into the, the memos that went out, you know, what, what, who, what does the IRS, what does anybody know? Um, there were about 13,000 people, I think was the number, um, they got notifications that, hey, some of your information may have been sent out. Um, if you're not sure if you were on that list, maybe you weren't. I believe you get a notification, so you should know if you're looking for it. Um, the judge ruled uh, in November that Coinbase specifically has to report anything over $20,000. I'm pretty sure Andrew, t Andrew touched on that as well. So um, when we're talking about transactions worth $20,000, we're talking about, um, I, would, I, might, I may talk a little bit like, a, like an accountant. I apologize if, 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 <laughs> if that's off putting or putting anything. But um, when we say transactions, we're talking about like top line, your gross proceeds is what they call it. So it's not how much you profited off of it, it's just the top number. I'm going to talk about what that kind of means. You got your top number, what you what, what you call your basis, and then the bottom one is your profit. If that top number is over $20,000, that number is going to be reported. So, go ahead. I, I'm open for questions by the way, please. Not what I'm saying. <laughs> if you take out a dollar, it's worth a dollar, you have to report it. Okay, so I get, uh, to, to the end, I'll, I'll, I'll circle back on this. This is no different if you sell, you sell a car, right? If you have your own car and you go out and you sell it and you make some money on it, you're supposed to actually report that. Does anybody know about it? No. You're supposed So can so are you supposed to report it? I'm not talking about tax avoidance or tax evasion. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, what's the? I mean, I, I appreciate the fact that you're supposed to report it, and I know legally you're supposed to report it, but no one would not. So here's a good example. For now. Yeah. For now, yeah. right? They lower the limit to five thousand, and then you have some questions to answer. Totally possible, right? Here's another way. This year it was ten thousand, right? Twenty thousand is the limit. You get away with it. Fine. You can sleep at night, fine. Your risk is on you. Let's say two years go by. You sell $40,000. That's over the 20,000 limit. Or maybe they drop the limit or whatever. In a subsequent year, within the next two or three years, you're over that limit and they say, all right, hey, you're on our radar, we know about it. You properly, let's say you properly report it. You do everything right. Chances are, depending on where we're at with regulation and what, how society feels about all of this, chances are you will be audited. 
When they do an audit, they've got a three-year look back. So they're going to go back three years. And they're going to go, hey, in 2017, did you, do, you, you did it now. Did you do it last year? Did you do it the year before? How, you, you, no. All right, well, that's probably not going to work, right? Well, they're going to they're gonna then go back and kind of look at, well, all right, you, you sold it for 40000 this year. When, when, when did you buy it? Three years ago. Oh, so you had it three years ago, too. Did you sell any three years ago? No. Show me the records. Uh-oh. I've got records. They're going to they're gonna exist. Or you can try to go, I'm not showing them to you. That audit generally won't go all that well for you, and I wouldn't recommend doing that. So things to consider, um, you know, in addition to, hey, what's right? What's the rule? Am I supposed to file it? Sure. Um, I might get away with it this year, but I've got subsequent events that it could come back to me this year. You're talking about a combination of every single transaction added together. You're not talking about a single event. Correct. I right. Think, uh, I think it's just single event. If you did transaction of 20. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is like a again kind of general guidance or or that you got it. We're done. Thanks. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> That's all I'm going to tell you tonight, really. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Very good question. Uh, generally, yeah. Um, what I'll tell you, and, and, and I mentioned this to somebody else, has anybody ever been through any kind of an audit? <laughs> I had a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, did you? <laughs> not because, by the way, not because you look like the type of person who might have, but you had some good questions. And maybe you went through it. Did you get the feeling that when you were being audited, that your auditor took the approach of, you're guilty until proven innocent? Oh, I knew his name. He would call me every year yep. and say, this is what I'm doing. I would say, you're never going to believe this. The files were, I had a flood, and, and it was pushed out, and there was a fire, and I don't have my taxes. And <laughs> I had every excuse under the book. And he, I was like, this guy's got to get promoted or fired, because he's calling me every year. Something's going to happen to this guy. Yeah. And he was working for months just to catch me on $58, $128, something stupid. It's a great use of taxpayer dollars, isn't it? <laughs> like, are you serious? This is what you're drilling me on? Yeah. And the guy called every year, and he dragged me through the coals. And I was like, he was like, send me a copy of all of your tax returns, everything you have. And I said, you're the IRS. I just sent everything to you. You know, I'm not going to give you the bullet to shoot me with. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And he did, and they came back with like months, months, months later. Yeah. Fifty-eight dollars. And, and and the reason that a lot of times that process takes so long is, and by the way, this is totally unofficial. Just my take from my experience is that they really do treat you like you're guilty until you're proven innocent. So to your point, you do a good job. You try as best as you possibly can. It's really confusing. They're going to go for whatever they think. And if they, if, they, if they see 50 grand deposit into your account, they're going to go, what's taxable? And this is my next slide. I talk about taxable events. The whole 50 grand. And you go, but I got records. I paid, I, 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 you know, I, I paid 49,000 for it. Why is the whole 50 taxable? Show me your records. They're really complicated to follow. They're, so then it's 50. Prove yourself innocent, right? Uh, unfortunately, it's the only it's the only <laughs> only world where they can kind of get away with it because the onus is on you. Prove it. Make sure it makes sense. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that too. About Just, I, mean, I know you know this. Maybe not that, but states, especially states, don't have their own people going after you for the money. They hire collection agents to come in. So and they're just as Same thing for the IRS. Yeah, so the moral of that general whole story is pay your taxes. <laughs> Don't get yourself into that position. And most importantly, and, and, and I'm going to kind of wrap, wrap at the end, is be ready. 
so that if and when it happens, it's not super convoluted and you can say, here's clear cut evidence, I'm, I'm, I'm innocent, you prove me wrong. And then they're probably gonna have a hard time doing that. So we're gonna go over main, main three things today. Um, we're, talk, we're talking a lot about, again, taxes. Could be a bit of a boring subject. We try to make it as, uh, in, at least informational. I don't know how exciting I can make it as possible. Um, Three main taxable events, trading a cryptocurrency for cash. I'm gonna start with there, probably spend most of my time there. Um, generally, it's gonna be, from my experience, again, one of the most common transactions that we see and that are, that are probably on the top of our head. By the way, I wanted to rewind all the way to the beginning. Today's March 1st, 45 days from now, everyone's responsible for filing their tax returns. So the purpose for talking about something so fun like taxes today is we thought it would be relevant <laughs> to, to, to our time frame here. We're also going to talk about another type of taxable event, trading a cryptocurrency for another cryptocurrency. And a third taxable event, and I'm kind of going in order of top of mind to least of mind, mining cryptocurrencies. So <clears throat> when I'm talking about Trading a cryptocurrency for cash, this is pretty simple. I own Bitcoin. I've already bought it at some, at some point. I've sold it. I've gotten money for it. That is a taxable transaction. What is taxable? I mentioned earlier you've got what I said were called gross, gross proceeds, the top line, what you sold it for. That's not necessarily what's taxable. The portion of that dollar amount that's taxable is basically your profit. So the difference between, I want to word this carefully, what it costs you to acquire that cryptocurrency and what you sold it for becomes a taxable event. So what it costs you to acquire that cryptocurrency is called basis. This is really not, not all that dissimilar from when you buy a stock. If I buy $100 worth of General Electric stock, my basis in that is $100. If I sell it for $150, I take the $150, subtract out the $100 in basis that I paid for it, I'm left with $50. $50 is taxable. And a slot on CNBC for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not worth it. Yeah, not right now. <laughs> Why don't you put the, the, like the fee the Okay, so I specifically use the terminology, the whatever it costs for you to acquire that coin. So, I spent $100 on it, and there was a $3 fee. My cost to acquire that coin is $103, not just the, the, the pure dollars out. Base sh should be tracked each and every time that you acquire <clears throat> any cryptocurrency. What I recommend, I don't know if I can use the word recommend, you're a lawyer, tell me, can I say recommend, or should I, su su should I suggest it? I don't know. Again, did we say this isn't legal or tax advice? I think we covered that. Don't depend on your exchange or anybody else, essentially, to track what your basis is. This stuff can get pretty complicated pretty quickly. Track your own basis. If I know I paid $100 for it, put that on a spreadsheet somewhere. Track where that $100 went. That's going to be the easiest thing to provide to an auditor and say, here's, here's how I got to what I computed my taxable gain to be. <clears throat> Basis can be tracked in one of three ways. By the way, I think I may have four listed because <laughs> three's not right. What's called FIFO, first in, first out. The first coin I bought is the first coin I sell. LIFO, last in, first out. The last coin I bought is, is the first one that I sell. Average cost, so that's, that's obvious to me. I don't know if it is to you guys. It's, take all the coins I bought, mix them all up, figure out what the average cost of that was and say, That's, that was my basis in whichever, whatever coin it was that I sold. And lastly, and this is why I know there's four, specific identification. I sold the coin that I bought, not first, not last, not the average, but that third one in that I bought, that I paid $20,000 for, let's say it's Bitcoin, in December. That's the coin that I sold today for $11,000 or $8,000, I don't even know where the heck it's at. <laughs> it's been working all day. Um, <clears throat> specific identification is generally going to be 
both the trickiest, but also generally the most beneficial because with that gives you, and this is getting back to a tax professional, gives you a lot of ability to strategize. Do I want to have a big taxable event right now? Do I not want to have a big taxable event right now? I may be able to easily, I say manipulate, which is usually not something you want to say with taxes or even anything in accounting, but I can kind of manipulate what my taxable gain is if I can say which one it is that I sold because I know my gross proceeds, that's my basis, and the difference is what I have to pay tax on. Question? In that, does it, in the sense that with Bitcoin, you could actually agree to track that, aside from subdivisions, does that have any basis, or is that just, I am arbitrarily declaring this one I bought over here is the one that I sold over here, or does that have to have a basis in reality? If you like to look at a ledger, sorry. So I, I think I understand your question. I'm going to try to answer it best I can. When you say, is there any basis, you mean like, does it stand up to? I just mean like, if, let's say I bought 10 Bitcoins and I sold 10 Bitcoins, can I just arbitrarily be like 3, 2, 1, 4? Or does there have to be some realistic basis for, well, we can look at you bought it into this address and then sent it out of this address. And that one's actually the same. You can't just claim that you sent another one. OK. so. You can arbitrarily do it. Okay. I'm going to go back to my whole 18-month veteran of this. So when you get into the specific okay. details of like which addresses and does that help, that's a little bit outside my, uh, for, from a technology standpoint. I buy some dollar bills. They all have a serial number. Can I, do I actually have to track the serial number of the bills that I bought and sold, or can I just arbitrarily say, well, this one is the one? So it would certainly help. Because you're most likely sitting front face to face with an IRS auditor who doesn't quite understand it. So if you can show them, or state or pet or whoever, right? If you can show them, here's the serial number. I bought it on this day for this dollar amount. I'm saying I sold that one with that identification number on it on this day for this gross amount. It's kind of hard for them to go, nah. Yeah. There's one situation where they can. And the key is you have to be consistent. When you choose specific identification, you've chosen specific identification for life. You can't say, hey, I sold that one, that serial number, and the next one I sold, oh, wait a minute, all my other ones are, you know, let's say, real low cost, so I'm going to have uh, a big gain. I want to use the last one I bought because that's got the highest cost. I, I can do that as long as I'm doing specific identification, but I can't just decide that, okay, everything is going to be the last one I bought. Because now I'm kind of getting into, that looks a lot like last in, first out. That's kind of LIFO. And, and now you're kind of giving an IRS auditor some kind of argument. right? So, or, or you can't go, let me just go average cost now. You chose specific identification, you're doing specific, specific identification. I'll tell you again, suggesting, most people want to do that specific identification because it gives you good opportunity to plan. Some people might go, well, you said earlier. Do I want to have a big taxable event this year? Generally, the answer to that question is no, right? But let's say you had some other weird circumstances. Let's say you own a business, and that business had a big loss that year. Might it be a good idea to trigger a taxable event in my cryptocurrencies to offset that loss? Yeah, it, it might be. That loss may not generate a whole lot of value for me, but if I know I've got a big gain sitting in my cryptos, and I want to apply that, I'm talking very general high level here, I want to apply that gain against that loss and essentially take my value in those cryptos and not pay tax on them, I might want to strategically trigger a taxable event in that situ situation. Again, maybe talking a little bit high level, different where tax professionals, people who can kind of help you go through this. They're going to say, first thing they're going to say to you, by the way, do you have a basis schedule? Meaning, do you have some kind of listing or schedule of what your basis is? So we can help you go through and do that. Question? Why is it up to me to determine which strategy to use? Why isn't it a set procedure as the IRS does? The IRS always does specific identification with Bitcoin, for example. So why, why, why do I have the freedom to decide which, which strategy to use? We haven't got that far yet. I mean, it's a pretty good question, right? Because you would figure that they may want just generally, to whatever's most beneficial for them, right? I don't know the exact answer to your question. My assumption would be it's probably been challenged time and time again. 
this is the rule as it is today. I can't give you the history on it. I just know that it is what it is. But I will tell you we should be thankful that we have it. Sure. Because it gives us the ability to really plan and figure out what's best for us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Throat here. So sale of cryptocurrencies. Andrew, I think you may have kind of brushed on this a little bit. The IRS treats them as personal property and therefore are taxed as what are called capital gains. Anybody know capital gains, ordinary income, what some of this stuff means? Have we heard of it? A little bit? Okay. Um, there's an IRS notice where they kind of gave notice. If you want to look it up, it's, it's a couple pages long. Um, uh, to me, it makes a lot of sense because it's written like an accountant would have written it. To you guys who are pretty well educated on blockchain technology, you might go, they don't know what they're talking about, and that's obvious. They wrote it basically like saying, it basically says, treat your cryptos just like you would your stocks. Capital gains. Capital gains have four possible categories. The first one being your ordinary income tax rate. The second one being the following three. Zero, 15, or 20%. <laughs> zero could be good, right? Ordinary rate is, so let's, ass let's assume you don't have any cryptos. You have W-2 income, you pay tax on it. It's called an ordinary tax rate. People generally have heard there's like seven of them, 10%, 15, I'm using 2017 numbers for anybody who knows tax laws change, but 2017 there was seven brackets. 10%, 15%, 25%, 28%, 35%, or 30%, 35%, 39.6%. I think I got them right. When you make W-2 income, it goes into that bucket, and depending on where you fall on, on a sliding scale, you pay tax at that rate. Capital gains are treated exactly the same way when the crypto that you sold, or the stock, or whatever it is, you acquired less than 365, 366 days ago. It's got to be short term, meaning one year or less. The gain is included in all of your other income. So what I'm going to try to illustrate here <coughs> is kind of how marginal tax rates work. Does anybody know what marginal tax rates mean? Okay, a couple people. In general, what it means is if I'm in a 25% tax bracket, it means I've made more than whatever the number is, $76,000 or whatever, if I'm married or single, it depends. Let's just go with a brief example that may be wrong. Let's say it's $76,000, depending on your situation. If I make that amount, I may be in a 25% tax bracket. Does that mean every single dollar that I earn, all 76,000, are taxed at 25%? No. It increases marginally. So think of it like beakers. You've got your first beaker, that's your 10% bracket. First thing you do is you take all your income, and in this case, this blue liquid, I assume it's water, I don't know what it is, this blue liquid represents all of your income. First thing you do is you take it and you fill it up. That gets, paid, that gets taxed at only 10%. Then you make some more money. Speaker's full, can't put anything more in the 10% bracket. So the next dollar you earn, depending on whatever the rate, the, the, the limits are, go into the next speaker. That gets taxed at 15%. You make more money. We go to the next speaker. I made more money, but not all that much more. That's taxed at 25%. So my first X number of dollars is taxed at 10. The next X number of dollars is taxed at 15. The last is only taxed at 25. My tax bracket, it's 25%. It's just kind of how we refer to it. Really what we're saying is the highest tax bracket that any of my dollars are subject to is 25% in this case. So when I have, when, when have short-term, I bought something, or I, I'm sorry, I sold something that I bought within the last year, depending on if I use specific identification or whatever it is. If it's within a year, I take that, I take my interest income, I take my W-2 income, I take my, my, my business income, all that stuff, swirl it up in a big bucket, and I pour it into these beakers. So how much, do, how much tax do I pay on my cryptocurrency? It's not direct, directly taxed in that case. It's kind of like trying to say, I don't know, pull out that atom of that water. You can't. It's all mixed in together. If there's any chemist in here, maybe you can, but I don't know. I can't. Yep. So when you say one of the four methods average costs, 
do you mean just like I entered the year with buying like one hundred dollar and I went out with two hundred dollars? What I mean, okay, so what I mean by average cost in your in, in, in basis is, I'll give you a simple example. I bought two coins during the year, or during whatever. I own two coins. The first one I paid $100 for. The second one I paid $50 for. I sell a coin. Let's say I use average cost. I take my 100, and I take my 50, and I say the average was 75. My basis in the coin that I sold, I didn't sell the first one, I didn't sell the last one, I don't know which one I sold, but I know that the average of them, the 100 and the 50 is 150 divided by two, $75. And that's my average cost. Does, does that help? So what happens if you then buy more and then later sell more? You just continue averaging? If, if you've chosen to use average cost as your method, you just keep kind of going with that. I now, I, I'm, I'm left with one coin with $75 average cost, whatever the next coin I bought was gets pulled in, I figure out what my average is, that's what, the next, that's what my basis and my next one that I sold is. I don't know if I'm answering your question. My denominator in that case, the number of coins that I bought that I divided by, is it, is it the total coins I've ever bought, including the ones I've sold, or is it only the ones I own plus the new ones that I own at the moment that I buy new ones? Does that make sense? It, it does, I think I'm too tired to, con <laughs> to process it, to be honest with you. What he's asking is if he has sold that coin, that part of the average cost is officially gone. It's kind of like retailing the work. Exactly, yes. If, if that helps, you are correct. That is the understanding, yes. That $75 goes away. What I'm left with is $75, okay? The FIFO, I don't know that. It may not be. All right, getting back to what we said earlier, everybody's situation is different. It, it, I'll tell you, it's the most commonly used. So when 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 you're looking at, um, let's say you get a Charles Schwab statement in the mail, you had some stocks that you bought and sold. They're probably using, yeah. You can use average. You can use the rest. They're probably going to give it to you on that. It's the most common. Doesn't mean it's the most beneficial. It could be the most easy, it could be the easiest, right? But in, the, in, a, in an up year, it's probably going to also generate the most taxable transactions for you. If you're a W-2, you're probably wanting to be out. If you're a 1099, you're probably want to do the, like the per coin thing. Because as your revenue or your, you know, the money you make in a year fluctuates, the write-off that you want to be able to attach to the coin you want to attach the right coin to it, and as long as you started off in the right spot in the beginning, you can just pick the coin that you want to attach to it and say, this is the one or these are the two, because you don't want to be giving money back to the government for no reason. So while I don't necessarily disagree or agree with you, what I'll say is, here's my summary. <laughs> if you're a 1099 employee, let's, Colloquially, I'll say you own a business of some kind. You therefore have some level of control. It may be vast, it may be micro. I don't know where your level of control is, but you have some level of control over what your other income is going to be, and that can certainly influence how you want to play. It, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a, uh, a tool in your tool belt when you're doing your tax strategizing. So what I mean by that is, let's say I own a business and I have a customer who owes me a lot of money, and I'm, at the end of the year I might go, don't pay me pay me in January, I don't want that income, right? That might generate a loss for you, great. Now I want to use specific identification and say trigger that taxable event. If I'm a W-2 employee and I'm, and I'm just gonna make whatever I make, maybe I wanna do it, maybe I don't. To your point, the nice thing is we have the availability to kind of pick and choose um, which one we wanna use. Again, the key is you just gotta stick with it, whichever one you choose. So we talked about the ordinary rate, we looked at the beakers, it's kind of how the margins work. Your, your, your gains on your cryptos get thrown into there, bang, 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 you pay some level of income, not necessarily the highest, not necessarily the lowest, kind of gets blended together. Long-term capital gains, on the other hand, they're the ones that are subject to either zero, 15, or 20%. They're different. So when you have a long-term capital gain, here's how it works. You've got these three rates, zero, 15, and 20. 
the amount that's assessed on your capital gain depends on what your tax bracket was. So I said back here, we define your tax bracket as the highest one at the end. So let's go with this example. This person is in a 25% tax bracket because that's their highest bracket. When we figure, okay, what's their capital gain? We look at the, the, the kind of the parameters here. We go, all right, if you're in the, it, I say zero, but if you're really in the 10% tax bracket, you pay no capital gains. If you were in 15 to 35%, and in that example I gave, we were at 25%, so that falls in there, you pay 15% on your capital gains. If you were in the 39% bracket, or this year it's a little bit lower, but let's just call it the highest one, you pay 20% on your capital gains. It's very binary. It's one of those three. It's not marginal. It doesn't increase based on anything. It's just where does it fall? So in this case, Again, we're in the 25% bracket, gains are taxed at 15%. I had this happen to a client recently, former client, I should say. <clears throat> they were close to the difference between the 35 and the 39% bracket. That number is, let's just round, make it easy, call it about half a million dollars in income. Which, in a world like last year, that could happen. Because when we compute that number, we're including what your gain is, okay? Let's say I made $499,999. And, and in this example, it's not the right number, just using it for illustrative purposes. That puts me in a 35% bracket. Good. My cryptos are taxed at 15%. If I make $1 more, whether it's in cryptos, W2, I get a bonus, whatever. All my cryptos are taxed at 20%, 5% more. Let's, let's use, let, let, I'll come to you in a second. Okay, let's assume you didn't have any W-2 income, nothing. All of that 500,000 or the 499,999 is from cryptos. That $1 difference in that income throws you into the 20% bracket. You're now paying another $25,000 in tax than had you sold $1 less. It is not marginal. It's not the next dollar is taxed at 20%. It's the whole kit and caboodle is taxed up there. A lot of opportunity for planning. You might have said, hey, I'm going to save some percentage of whatever I sell throughout the year. Assume it's all long term. And then forget, oh, wait a minute. I got to include all my other income in there. I might be 5% short. Could be a very material number. So <clears throat> what, you're, what you're saying is they don't have any earned income. They don't have like W-2 or 1099 type income. All they have is their capital gains income. And those rates kind of vary, as you can see. If I made, let's say I made, in, and go back to my example, $490,000. So if I made that in purely in a W-2, I'd be paying tax of 35% on my $490,000. In addition, by the way, I'd be paying Social Security and Medicare, it's rounded up, about another 8% in employment taxes on that, right? So that's me as a W-2 employee, I may be paying 43% in tax. Let's assume I am Warren Buffett or trust fund baby or what have you, I to make $490,000 just in capital gains. $490,000, we run it through my beaker thing, we go, all right, what, what bracket is that? That's the... 35% bracket, right? Because if it was W-2 income, it'd be 35%. What's my tax on it? 15%. And that's where people say, that's not fair. This is where you heard in 2012, Mitt Romney pays a lower tax rate than his secretary. His secretary's paying based on that rate. He's paying based on that rate because his income isn't from a W-2, it's from capital gains. That's kind of what that, how, that, how that conversation goes. Uh, I don't want to go too much more into it because I could get off topic a little bit, but um, that's generally what people are saying. Correct. 
Correct. You are correct there. In, in, in that example. All right, let's move on. Trading crypto for crypto. By the way, that was probably where I'm going to spend most of my time. A lot of what we've hopefully learned there kind of applies in, 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 in trading cryptos for cryptos. So no cash changes hands. This is, th this is one where it gets con confusing sometimes, right? So when you sell a cryptocurrency and buy another one with it, I take a, a Bitcoin and I get an Ether token for it, let's say, that is a taxable transaction. There's no cash. There may not any be anything reported, depending on the amounts, what have you. But there is still something that gets taxable. Well, we look at that as going, no cash, nothing's, nothing I need to worry about. The IRS views it as if the cash was exchanged anyway. <clears throat> so on that trade, you're, you're going to have to look at, what was my basis in my original coin when I sell it? whatever I sold it for, what was the value of it at that time, taxable gain. I take that taxable gain essentially and I go buy my next cryptocurrency. Your little, yo. Uh, to have some structure for thinking, is that like if I bought shoes with gold, would that be the same thing? It's an asset for an asset? And assuming there's some taxable transaction in buying shoes for gold? Like if I took gold to the shoe store and got shoes, I yeah, so here, here, here's a good, it's a taxable event for the, for the shoemaker, right? Because you, you've, you, you've taken gold and you haven't given him cash, but he, he sold a shoe to you. He's got income. Right, but the, now if I bought the gold for a dollar and held it until it was $1,000, would I have a taxable event too? This is kind of a tangent, so I just wanted to see if it's the same thinking. Not prepared to answer that right now. Okay. Best way to put that. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, you're throwing me off my, 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 my mojo here. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm not even necessarily looking for an answer, but just to continue the thought experiment. I mean, you presumably traded a
to know how that may be treated. I may give you some insight into some things to think about. By the way, the mic just came back on. It was bizarre. Like what? I'm like, I don't think I started talking any loud. <laughs> um, when I talk about mining, maybe it'll give you some insight. Because I, I, I just, I don't understand the technology enough to be quite honest with you to be able to answer that level of the question. Yeah. <laughs> it depends on the situations that depend on, yeah. 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 So getting getting back to this, when you're when you're trading cryptos for cryptos, your bases can get confusing for all of these different reasons. And in the end, I may have started with a Bitcoin. No cash, no cash, no cash. I went from Bitcoin to Litecoin to Ether, and I'm just going to use the three of them because they're the ones that I'm. It's in my simpleton head about. And I've got a Litecoin at the end that I sell. What do I pay tax on on the on that Litecoin? Because when I went from Bitcoin to Ether, taxable transaction, I had to figure that out. When I went from Ether to Litecoin, I have some basis in there still. It becomes very confusing. I go back to discuss all of this with a tax professional before you get started. It may be too late for some of you. Go to one now anyway and just go cards on the table. Hey, if I don't want to claim it, I'm going to tell you right off, right off the bat and go, I just want advice. I'm not engaging you to file my returns. But cards on the table, what should I do about this stuff? Here's the information I've got. And a lot of times they might go, go recreate this in the following manner. Again, when I go back to the difference between a tax professional and a tax preparer, tax professional is going to give you that advice and give you some ideas on how to go, to, how to go recreate it. <laughs> yeah, he's going to go, hey, you want to take the cards off the table? Some of them I go, I would just want to file your return because you already put them on the table and now I know about them. <laughs> so the last one I'm going to talk about, which I find is one that, to be honest with you, when I, did, when I did a little bit of research and I read some IRS guidance, it wasn't anything formal, I went, I didn't think of that. And that's a taxable transaction when I actually mine a coin. <clears throat> So again, commonly overlooked from my experience is what is the taxable transaction on that? Whatever the fair market value is to be determined when you mine a coin. So let's not go into Dan coins and whatever the example you guys were giving. Let's go to like super high level and easy for somebody like me and thankfully the majority of people who raise their hands and say, I mine a Bitcoin. Great. What's it worth? I don't know which exchange we use. The IRS is going to go with the highest. But whatever that value is, that is, ta that is taxable to me as ordinary income. So that first example where we've, where we've got the different buckets, it gets mixed into that, ba in, into that batch of water and poured into wherever it is. When you're mining it, right? So they almost, almost look at it, almost, as if your W-2 day job is to mine bitcoins. OK? Could be. Okay. <laughs> that is a, that, that's a, that. is it, does anybody recognize this as utterly ridiculous? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that. Get, it's mining for a reason. It's manual labor. It's it, effectively That's how they look at it. It was a case you gave 1950 standards, right? This is, this is, this is, this is where their, this is where their mindsets are, right? They go, they, they don't care that there's like some rack of computers doing the work for you. They go, it's ordinary income. You mind it because you went like this. And that's how you did it. That's what the, that's 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 what that's what it's currently looking like. How they're how they're handling it. It it yeah. Look, Jeff, if you you find money on the street, it's ordinary income to you. You find gold on the street, yeah, it's income to you. Okay, so it was kind of interesting. You asked that. I don't know if anybody saw that. As you asked it, this was like floating up. It's kind of cool. Um, generally, and how many people in here are in somehow involved in tech? Shocking. <laughs> um, if you're a developer, consider this. The guidance that I that I've read is if 
you are somewhere in the industry of maybe developing and they could be somehow construed that when you mind it that was part of your ordinary business and your ordinary business is subject to social security yes it can be you could you, you're gonna have arguments to make you're gonna go I don't do I don't I don't mind for a living and they go what you sit at a computer and you write code isn't that how you get a Bitcoin it's the same thing it's subject to self-employment tax because un, un, until they basically recruit people who sit in millions of these types of seminars by people who quite honestly are far more qualified than myself to even be giving them and then say okay you're now in our Bitcoin or our cryptocurrency audit division they're sending out the auditor who goes I got this because the auditors, to be honest with you, they come out, you're guilty until proven innocent. And they are basically, don't tell anybody if anybody knows any auditors for, the, for any states, they are basically there just to collect money for the government. They're, they're collection agency. They're basically told, don't come back with nothing. Spend months, but come back with something. $58, we're good, you found something. It's crazy, but yeah. So if I can find that extra 8% and go, I, th I think I can win this. You, you sit at a computer all day. <laughs> we can get that extra 8% in Social Security. Somebody's getting promotion. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I, 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 I kid, but yes, that was, I specifically put that in there because I, I, I had read that in some guidance. Is there a tax implication of where the mining equipment is actually located? Even if you're at the keyboard in your house, but the mining equipment is in another state or even another country? <laughs> 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 Is it? So, the, the, I, and I say because certainly on the capital gain, on the on, on, on the mining part, I could see it kind of be. Here, here's what I'll tell you again: the U.S. is going to say yes, and then if it's in Iceland, they're going to go, "No, you did it here. We get that." Now you're getting an international tax, and that's one thing I didn't do in my past 12 years at all. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a pretty interesting. Uh, thought exercise, it really is. Yeah, so so you, you, you have, you, yes, you, you're correct. You, let's go back quite a few years where it didn't take so much power.
I have I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I honestly don't. <laughs> Uh, my initial thought is, I, I think so. Here, here, here's what I hear is tax. If I got rid of my Ethereum and it was work, my mic's back on. If I got rid of my, there, no. I, I got rid of my Ethereum to do something with it, taxable event. Whatever I did with it, if I took that and then went and put it in, I, I, again, I don't really understand your question, but if I took that and went and put it in, let's say mining software, that's basis in my mining software, but I do have to pay tax when I got rid of that Ethereum. So you, you could then write it off because you bought an asset. You're getting into some crazy basis stuff. <laughs> like, whoa. Uh, he was first. I don't come to you, Andrew. I don't know if I answered. So I'll address it two ways. One, yes. The thing you need to worry about is your basis. Make sure you've got that. You bought it X number of years ago. You might you whatever. You've got that record. That record sits until whenever you decide to dispose of it. So. Okay, so that's part two. What I'll call.